Good evening, everyone. Paul Chamberlain, the Air Force guy here this evening. And, you know, I had a, had somebody ask me the other day to go over something that would be helpful for them. So I thought tonight would be a great time for me to do that. And that is RV construction. So there's because there's so much information out there and you really don't know who to believe. So uh, let me say hello to everybody. George Danik, he's, he's that... Um, millionaire friend of mine. He's up there in the UP right now. He's going to be heading back down to Florida after it cools down. We got uh, Chuck Ash. Appreciate that. He's from the Eastern Shore here in Maryland. Good guy, Bruce. Good to see you here this evening. So uh, when you're out camping, that's good to hear there, uh, George. We'll join you one of these days. So, you know, there's a number of different ways that uh, RVs can be constructed. You know, when every one of them has its pluses and minuses, you know, they're not all bad. And I'm going to try and share some screen here, bring up some stuff, uh, and I'm going to see if I can get get this thing working here. Um, but um, I want to get over here. Um, and, again, I'm trying to learn how to do this stuff here. Oop, get that up there. Oop, wrong thing. So, sorry about that. Oh, I think I might have just got rid of it. Oh, okay, but I might have got rid of it, what I was looking for. Apparently, I did. Well, let me go over here. I need to kind of find it where I can uh, bring stuff over to my other screen. Again, I'm just starting to do this stuff, and I'm still trying to learn all the different nuances of uh, – Things. And of course, I've got it backwards. I'm going to figure this stuff out here one of these days, and uh, we're going to get it figured out. But uh, anyway, but uh, does what's everybody doing these days? Everybody having fun? Because I'll tell you what, at work we are just busy as all get out. And with that in mind, what I want to do is I want to make sure that everybody understands if you're dealing with a um, I got everything over there I needed. Good deal. If you are dealing with a small business, especially in the RV industry, be sure that you're patient. I mean, we are being overrun between phone calls, appointments, deliveries, uh, people showing up without appointments. So we're being pulled in all different types of directions. So be patient. You know, if you call somebody and they didn't get back to you, shoot them an email as a reminder. Um, you know, and, you know, they're going to get back to you. I mean, there's times I'm leaving work there at 8 o'clock at night, and I still have people to get back to. And then, of course, I feel bad trying to call them at 8 o'clock at night. So I end up not doing it. So, but anyway, in, let me pull up. So in a typical um, wall, what you have is you have different, let me see if I can get this pulled up here. I went to the wrong screen. Let me see if I can get this thing pull down here and pull it over here. There we go. So, and can, can you see that okay? What's that? I'm trying to see if I have that sharing on the screen yet. Let me see if I get a share screen again. Let me see if that does it. There we go. Now let's share it. Let's see if it does. There we go. Maybe that's a little better. So in a typical laminated sidewall, is it up yet more? Right, tell, tell me what I know. We're, we've got a delay here, but in a typical laminated sidewall, you're going to have multiple layers. Now, depending on what you have, what I have up in front of us right now, this is a. Uh, I'm going to try to make it bigger here. And hopefully, that you can see it. As you're going to see, you have multiple layers. Got in, in this particular case, it's showing a fifth wheel, but it's going to be the same whether it's a travel trailer, fifth wheel, um, or even if it's a, um, even if it was a truck camper. But what you have is you're going to have your interior wall. You're going to have either aluminum for studs or you're going to have wood for studs. Inside the uh, aluminum or the wood studs, you're going to have different types of, of insulation, which I'll go over. Now, sometimes they're going to have they could have some type of a vapor barrier in between 
the different sides of the walls. On this particular one, you're going to see that in number two and three, both of those are two different pieces of Luan. And what they'll do on some RVs, they're doing that uh, because it makes it stronger, as well as will hide the seams if they're having more than one. So different things. Now, in this one here, number four would be, that would be the block foam insulation that they'd be putting inside of the wall area. So one is the fiberglass on the outside. Two and three is Luon. Number four would be your foam block, block foam insulation that would be going into the different areas within the wall. Um, number five is just the window, but number seven is the aluminum, and number six is your interior wall. As I said, sometimes they're going to have vapor barriers in there as well. That just shows you that particular one. Let me see if I can get over to the other one. I'm going to minimize that one um, and show you what it looks like with it in just gonna drag it over here I just got to get it pulled over here now so what this is showing you is what it would be looking like if it was wood you're just gonna have wood within it it'll be up there it'll be up here momentarily um, but as you can see is Again, it's, this, this would be a laminated sidewall using fiberglass. Now, they do have that where they are laminating a sidewall using wood studs. So you have laminated sidewalls with fiberglass using aluminum or with wood. Be sure that you ask that question. Ask them um, what it is. If, if, you, if, if you're really not sure, a couple places you could check, you could check in the when you open up a storage door, you can kind of look in that area. Or if you're opening up the entrance door, you can look in where the hole where you'd actually be putting the deadbolt and so forth in it. That's another area it would be in. So that would be what that looks like. Now, something else that you have, I'm going to get this stuff down to a science here one of these days. I just got to do it more often. Another thing that you hear about out there is something called Asdale. And what Asdale is, instead of, instead of using a uh, wood product laminating the sidewall to, they're laminating it to Asdale. Asdale is a, or they might even use, there's other companies using just a composite material. Now, the benefits to composite material is the fact that it's lighter then a Luan, which would be the wood substrate. Um, it's, an, a, it's an added insulator. It's also, it will not absorb water. Now, the downside to the Anasdale or a composite type wall is that it's not as strong from a, from a if, if you're trying to rip the material apart, it's actually fiberglass will adhere better to Luan than it would Asdale. But there are people that, you know, that's what they want. And there are companies out there that use the Asdale. You know, so there's pluses and minuses with everything. I'm going to get this thing figured out here. See, I, have, I think I got my screens backwards. So um, I'm going to get it. Now, if you were looking at one that was made with, with wood, what we call, what I would call stick and tin. This is kind of giving you an idea of what stick and tin would look like. So what you have is, this is the metal. What I, the reason why we call it stick and tin is the two by fours or two by threes, whatever they're using in there, that's going to be what we call the sticks. The tin is going to be the metal siding that they're putting on there. And as you can see on this particular one, the way it's actually constructed. Some companies do a better job with others. Now, the benefit of a what we would call a stick and tin is you would never have to worry about delamination. You know, if you have a laminated sidewall, you could have delamination if you don't take care of things. Now, with wood, if you're not taking care of it, 
and you're getting water into the walls, well, then you could have wood rot, mold mildew, and things of that nature. So anybody have any questions on what I've covered so far? Maureen, has anybody questioned anything? Nothing yet? Okay. Just pipe in. If somebody, if somebody shoots a question in, my moderator over here, she'll uh, give me a heads up, and we'll figure it out on that. Now, when you notice that they were using a what we called a um, what we called a um, wood side or the, the stick and tin, and they were using the uh, making me let me get bigger here. But anyway, they were using a battened uh, insulation, just like you'd use for your home. And they do use those in some fiberglass situations as well. And I'm going to get into that here in a moment. Typically, when you see a laminated sidewall, this is what it's going to look like before they laminate the um, fiberglass and the Luon to the wall. Now, there are a couple different ways that somebody can uh, laminate their sidewalls. And the ways that you're doing, let me just try to get, get my... Uh, my mouse to work here. Oh, I see I'm on the wrong screen. There we go. Back to the right screen. So, the, so there's two different ways of laminating a sidewall. One way is what they call pinch rolling. That's basically what they're going to be doing is they will be um, gluing the pieces together and they're running it through rollers and then rollers are going to be running across the thing for a period of time to get it to adhere. So that is one way of laminating a sidewall. Now, another way you could laminate a sidewall is what they consider acubond. And that's basically where they're taking, in some of these places, they'll take a, um, a whole sidewall, could be 40 feet in length, and it's on a table. And after they glue everything together, they're going to go ahead and suck out, kind of like a freezer bag. If you ever used a freezer bag, that uh, those where you suck all the air out of and what that's going to do is that's going to give a certain amount of equal pressure consistently across the wall until it dries. Now, these manufacturing plants that are doing the proper lamination process, they will have these laminating rooms set up so that they can see what the humidity is in the room and the temperature, because that is critical. You can't have too much humidity and you can't have too little. You need the right amount of humidity, and I forget what the number is, in order for that um, that sealant to uh, seal. So that is what that is for. Now let me see if I can get this thing going again. I'm going. I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to go over here. Get something down here. Now there's another thing what we call a hung hung wall construction. And basically what you're going to do with hung wall construction is basically what they do is they're going to build the RV, whether it be um, in this case, you're looking at a fifth wheel, whether it's a fifth wheel, class A, whatever RV, they're going to build the frame out first, typically 16 inches on center and so forth. And then what they're going to do is they're going to be they're going to be building it from the inside out. And then that's how they're going to be able to hang the sidewall on, on the, the aluminum. And what they're doing is, let me show you, Numar is one that's been doing it for, for years. And let me show you what their process kind of looks like here. So what you have is, in this, you could see that, they already have the interior wall. They even have some of the uh, cabinets and so forth built. And now they're putting the batten insulation inside the wall. Now, the companies that do this effectively, what they're doing is they're actually going to glue that batten insulation inside the walls. That way they are over time, as you're driving or towing your RV, it's not going to be moving and shaking and creating gaps in your, in your um, sidewall. Now, you'll notice... What Numar does, when you look closely at their aluminum structure, 
they have holes punched out in the aluminum walls. And what this allows them to do is run the wires through the wall, and that allows them to get it from point A to point B without it being an issue. They're not having to run it through cabinets or through the roof and things of that nature. So that's what you call a hung fiberglass wall. Now, let me get out of that. I think that's pretty much all I've got on that. So let me stop sharing there. So now let's talk about, so those are the different ways of laminating walls. And you've got lamination, you've got hung wall. Another one I'm sure you're probably very familiar with is the metal, metal construction that you typically see on an airstream. Uh, that's a whole different animal. It's almost like, uh, you know, if you're looking at class B vans that are, you know, it has a molded type um, thing. So, and they're riveted and so on and so forth, but it's a, you know, classy type of a construction. Now, there are some pop-ups out there that do an automotive metal, which it's kind of hollow in the middle, and that kind of helps with uh, insulation, although there's no insulation in them. Um, and you could see those, Somerset is one that comes to mind when they're constructing that. We see what else I might might have missed going over that. Um, and so those are the different styles of sidewalls. Now, when you're talking, talking, those are sidewalls. Then you're going to be getting into front caps, your rear caps, uh, the sides on your slide outs, and so forth. Those walls, well, your I would say the sides on your uh, slide outs can be a can be a laminated wall. They could be just a hung wall, although it's not going to be a hung wall like I was showing you with Newmore. It's just going to be kind of sitting there, and you could tell if you're ever looking at a an RV, whether it be a travel trailer, a fifth wheel, or even motorhome, the slides are out. If you knock on that sidewall of a slide, you will be able to tell the difference between what they would consider a hung wall, which really has no weight bearing to it, versus one that would be a laminated wall that would give you a little bit more structure. Um, the ones that are just hung in place there, you will feel that they're soft. And in some cases, they do the same thing on the backs of RVs, the back wall, and sometimes you look at them and you look at them and you think, dang, it looks like there's water damage. Well, there really isn't. It's just the way the wall is designed. So keep that in mind when you're looking at those. By the way, if anybody has any questions on these things that I'm going over, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Did you say those questions? Yes, question. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, that was Blake. Blake from New Vision Security. Um, he's not in. New Vision. Can you let Paul? I'm leaning towards the 2250. Okay. All right, you need the fireplace. All right, that's that's all right there, Blake. Some people call him Blake. Some people call him Block A. I mean, it just depends on whether you're a teacher or whether you're just a student. So anyway, um, now let's, so the other thing you, you'll see on front and rear uh, rear caps of, um, of RVs, some you'll see metal. Sometimes you'll look at the front and Passport was one and there's a few others where you push on the front and you can feel it actually, it's like it's soft. And that's kind of just laid in place. It's a piece of fiberglass. And, you know, it has insulation and stuff in it. You've got to make sure that if that's the way your front of your RV is, make sure you check those seams all the time. And I would tell you to check those seams after every trip. And you're going to have the marker lights up at the top, seams coming down, and you're going to have a seam across that where your fiberglass meets the rock guard. Check those seams, I would tell you, every time you tow with one of those. And the reason for that is because that wind pushing on it, it flexes. And with that flexing, it will you'll get some seams um, that break. And if you allow that to go untreated and you're not resealing when you're supposed to, that will definitely create issues there. Um, so that's that. So you'll see that. You'll also see some metal. Ones up in the front, which are great. And like the ones, I know Transcend, the way that they do the metal is they'll interlock the metal pieces as it's coming down the front. That way you're getting no water that's, as you're driving and if it's raining, it's seeping up into the seams. They do a phenomenal job on that. Then, of course, one of the best ones out there is when you're getting the molded fiberglass caps. 
Now, as you get into the higher end ones, that'll be a full molded cap. And then some of your fifth wheels that have a rear molded cap and so forth. Those you're getting into more money when you're getting into that stuff. But those are the types of construction that you're going to have front and back. Now, next thing we're going to talk about. Did somebody have a question? Oh, well, and, you know, and I appreciate the question there, James. Listen, and people ask me all the time, Paul, is it worth buying a stick and tin? Absolutely. I don't care if you're buying the least expensive trailer that is on our lot or whether you're buying the most expensive. If you don't do the necessary upkeep on it, it isn't going to last. Keep in mind, an RV is not an investment in the sense of money. It's an investment in memories that will last a lifetime for you. And that's what you got to keep. You got to keep in mind. But the more money you spend, obviously, the less it's going to be worth over time. You've got to understand. So just keep that in mind. But it doesn't matter what level of RV that you buy, the better you do it um, checking and resealing and caulking as needed and using the right types of, of sealants on them, you will, it's going to pay back on your, inv on your investment in, uh, as far as not having, you're going to have less headaches and you're going to enjoy yourself more. So keep that in mind. Now, Let's talk about roofs because there are three different types. Well, there's actually four different types of roof materials that are out there. You know, everybody's familiar with rubber roofs. And the knock on rubber roofs is the fact that as they get dirty, you get the black streaks down the side of your coach. Now, the reason why you're getting black streaks down the coach is because as you tow your RV or you're driving your RV down the road, the air is going across the top of that roof. And what that's doing is that's creating electricity on the rubber roof. And what that does is now any dirt is going to be, it's going to be pulling that dirt right into the roof. So you need to clean it properly. Now, how do you clean your roof? The one thing you have to remember with a rubber roof is you do not use any type of a uh, cleaner that has a petroleum distillate in it. Any petroleum in it, you don't use it. If you do, you're going to break down the rubber and it's going to fail. So you say, well, Paul, what am I supposed to use? One of the best things you can use to clean a rubber roof is Dawn dishwashing detergent. And that stuff works like a charm. Now, you do that on a regular basis. And then what I would tell you to do is before you put it away for the winter or if you want to wait till you bring it out in the spring, whatever works for you, use um, a material that I like to call, it's it's a rubber roof conditioner, or I'm sorry, cleaner and then a conditioner. Now, I like the Protect All brand. I know there's a Dicor brand. I just, I, for whatever reason, I like the, the Protect All brand. And what you have to do is clean it with that. And I'll tell you, it's a night and day difference when you clean a rubber roof properly. And um, the Dawn Dishwasher Church is going to do wonderful as well. But clean it, and then you wait 24 hours, and then you condition it. And what that does is that's going to keep the membrane um, pliable and it's going to help it in its long term. You don't need, I know they talk about people that talk about sealing the rubber roof. You don't need to do that unless it's really bad. And they have, they have different things you can do out there. If you take care of your rubber roof and do what I, what I explain and something that I have in my book that I give to my customers, that rubber roof will last you longer than you. Flat out. It'll take care of itself. Now, so that's the rubber roof. The next thing you have is TPO. Now, I want to go ahead and pull up TPO. Give me a second here. I'm going to get over my other channel, over my other one here. And this one here, make sure I'm on the right page here, share the screen. People say, well, Paul, what is TPO? Well, TPO stands for thermoplastic polyorphan. Now, to make it a little bit easier for you to understand, I liken it to more of a cross polymer type vinyl. And the benefit of TPO over rubber is that let's say that you had a tree fall on your, on your roof or a branch and it poked a hole in rubber. Rubber is kind of like getting a chip in your windshield where it will run. With a TPO roof, because it's a cross polymer type vinyl, so it has fibers in it, is not going to run. Now, you can patch those in place 
and you'll be fine. You don't have to replace the whole roof if you get something like that on either of them. So that is what that is. Next thing you have is, of course, the aluminum roofs you've seen. You know, I know Holiday Rambo used to do it. You have them on. There's some of your uh, low-end trailers that have on there. And those things, just regular type, you know, caulking on it. Although I would recommend you could use the die core caulking for that because what you really want to have when you're sealing on a roof, whether regardless of what it is, you want something that is a self-leveling caulk. And the benefit to you there is it's going to spread out and it's going to do the job. Now, one might ask, well, Paul, how often am I supposed to um, caulk my, my unit? Well, by the book, what it tells you is every 90 days you're supposed to be checking and resealing as needed. Now, in reality, chances are most people aren't going to do that. But I tell you this, listen, if you take the time to wash your unit, and let's say you're washing your unit twice a year, and you're done washing it, take the extra 15, 20 minutes and look over your coach. And you're asking me, well, Paul, what am I supposed to look for? Anywhere there was something, a hole put in the sidewall, front cap, rear cap, and roof. That's where you're checking. And then make sure you're using the proper proper sealants when you're uh, resealing. Now, if you want to make it nice and pretty, remove the old stuff. If not, clean them off real good, and then reseal. Now, the, the next roof material, this is something that just came out recently, is it's a PVC roof material. Now, this PVC roof material, I don't particularly like the way that they're marketing it. They're marketing it as a no-maintenance roof. or I'm sorry, no, maintenance-free roof. Let me tell you, folks, there ain't no such thing as maintenance-free, not in this industry. And I harp on that all the time. And you're going to see people that see that uh, on publications where they have a PVC roof and it says maintenance free and they're not going to go up there. They're not going to clean it. They're not going to walk. They're not going to wash it. They're not going to check and reseal as needed. Let me tell you what I think that they need to they need to re, um, remarket that product and saying that you do not. It's. It's not a maintenance-free roof. It's basically you don't have to treat it like you would a rubber roof. Same thing with a same thing with a TPO roof. Same thing with thing with a metal roof. You don't need to treat it like a rubber roof. And that's really all they're saying. But by saying maintenance-free roof, I see in the next three to five years, because these things have just come out, you're going to get people that have water damage through their roofs, and they're going to be bringing it in the service and saying, "Hey, why the heck do I have leaks?" You know, I was told I have a 15-year warranty, and it said maintenance-free. So now let's talk about the roof warranties, because this is another area that people, I guess, some people oversell these roof warranties. So if you have a fiberglass roof, you have a 10-year warranty. R uh, rubber or TPO, you have a 12-year warranty. These PVC roofs have a 15-year warranty. Understand, that doesn't mean that you don't have to do anything for the 10, 12, 15 years. Don't think that in that you're going to be getting a free roof, like in your house you had a hailstorm and you just got to pay a deductible and they're going to replace your, your roof. It doesn't work that way. The way it works, it's they're prorated to remove it, and it's only, if you read your owner's manuals on these roof materials, it is for defects in the material. That's all. And understand that after a certain amount of years, Let's say it was year, and I'm just going to use a hypothetical here. Let's say use year six, that was uh, found that you had a defect in the material. They're going to give you the material. You're going to be paying for the labor to install them. And guess where the cost is for replacing a roof in the labor? So they could be upwards of $6,000 or more. Now, there is something else that you can do with your roof materials out there that you can do after the fact. And I forget what they what they call them, but I'd like it to like an RV helmet. I, 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 and I can't remember. Somebody could chime in here if, um, if you could. And it's basically where they put a coating on your roof, and it costs four, five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000, depending on the size of your camper. And it is – it basically – negates you from having to reseal anything on your roof because the way that this thing is put on the roof, you don't have to worry about it. Now, you're going to want to wash it. But for those of you that want less maintenance 
and something that's going to work, that would be the one I would tell you to go ahead and look at. So, yes, and uh, Blake, that does. It says the it says one piece roof membrane on twelve year warranty, and that's on the Grand Design, and that is a TPO roof. So on the Grand Design, they're using TPO on the Imagines, the Reflections. Um, solitudes and all that they're using the PVCs on the transcends and they'll be expanding the they're, they're testing that PVC out to see how well it's going to work out so far things have been working well time will tell so and I know there's other there we go thank you Chuck RV arm that's what they call it and I'll tell you that's just that is a heck of a product check them out if that's something that's going to work for you for those of you that maybe maybe you can't get up on a ladder maybe you don't want to pay somebody else to, to do that that's a heck of a product to put on your roof. So, so okay, our slide outs walk. So the slide outs, although some will claim that they're walkable, I would tell you to be very careful. And keep in mind also that walkable roofs typically are rated at 220 pounds. Same thing with the rear ladders. Although we have people in our shops, they'll show you, no, you know, they'll hold have your people. The big key is watch where you're walking and, you know, you don't want to be putting chairs up there and things of that nature. But with slide outs, for those of you that don't have um, slide toppers, I would tell you to go ahead and go ahead and check the tops of your slide outs prior to bringing in. And I just had, had a customer of mine tell me 6,500 to replace a roof and he had the 337 reflection fifth wheel. Um, but that is a, that's about a 35, I believe 35 foot fifth wheel. So pretty, pretty good chunk of change to re have a, a roof replaced and the materials not that expensive. So anyway, what, well, yeah, we, and I, I answered that one already. And it's a twenty-two fifty there, Blake. I know you probably fat fingered that one, but uh, oh, so, oh, for RV armor, okay, RV armor to put it on that was sixty-five hundred. Sorry, okay, good deal. So that pretty much wraps it up as far as RV construction. You know, I kind of went through things quickly there. I hope people were able to digest it. Does anybody have any questions on things that I went over here this evening? Did it, was it helpful? Give me a thumbs up if, if this is working for you. If you learned something new tonight, uh, if, maybe if I misspoke, let me know. I mean, listen, I always tell people I know enough to be dangerous. I don't claim to know it all. So, but I do appreciate everybody that came in the roof, uh, came in the room to uh, hear, hear what I had to say here this evening. And uh, if somebody has a comment uh, on a particular um, item that you would like me to cover next week at 8 o'clock, let me know. And by the way, here, and I don't know when I'm going to be doing it at this time, but I'm going to be doing a special um, YouTube Live specifically for uh, Make-A-Wish again. I'm putting together some things. Um, I still need to talk to them about topics and so forth. And I'm hoping I'm going to be able to put something together to get people to understand what Make-A-Wish is all about. They're doing a, a phenomenal job. Down below this, I do have a link if you'd like to donate to that company. And by the way, for those of you that would like um, an Air Force guy sticker, just, I have an address below. Shoot me a uh, self-addressed stamp envelope. And I'll mail one out to you. So just shoot that out to me. Be more than happy to send that out to you. My customers, you get a special one. And uh, also get PJ the bear. I don't have any here left this evening. I got to get a whole new uh, bunch of those. I, I ran out at work today. I had to have my wife bring it down for me. Almost forgot to give one to my customers. So, But I do appreciate everybody coming in here this evening. Again, I hope you all learned something. I hope this was helpful. And uh, we'll be coming back at you again next week. Okay, what do you think of the Henderson anti sway system? Henderson. Did you mean the Anderson, Blake? Not Henderson. 
because I think you might might have wanted to say the hand because uh, there's also I went over the different anti sway systems that were out there. One of which um, was it wasn't the Henderson. And now now I'm losing. But I, I'm thinking, Blake, you're you're talking Anderson, right? Let me know on that. We're talking to Anderson. The Anderson, I am not familiar with that, although I find it difficult to understand how a chain can give you anti-sweat. Um, you know, we recommend for the size trailer that you're looking at, we recommend the Reese weight distribution with the dual camp sway system. It's not a complex system and it works very, very well. Um, so, so, but hey, listen, like I say, I know enough to be dangerous. We use the, we use the, uh, we use the Reese and we use the Blue Ox for smaller things. And of course we have sway bars for pop-ups and, and smaller trailers and so forth. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of different systems out there in the market. I mean, I know Equalizer and Equalizer, there's other ones that have kind of the same thing as Equalizer. You know, it just works for you. Um, bunch of different ones out there. So anyway, so listen, I do appreciate everybody coming in here this evening. And if uh, you have any questions, my contact information is down below the video. Uh, feel free to reach out to me and I could uh, talk to you one on one if need be. So thanks again. And uh, we'll hopefully see you next week.